watching them do it. Uh, it's, it's just such a, just such an awesome thing to see young people grab onto God with both hands. It's wonderful. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, that is Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife as a slave. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing, a small fortune. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Has anybody ever shown up at your door and expected you to cure someone of something incurable? No? I've experienced this a few times as a paramedic. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. And as soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to be cured of his leprosy? What's his angle? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, with his money and clothes, and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to to say to him, he wouldn't even come out and meet with him. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me. I thought that he would come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. I thought that he would wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Paraphar, aren't these rivers of Damascus better than all of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, if he had told you to mount up your horse and go to the stars and bring a star down from the sky, if he had told you to go win a great battle against one of the giants, if he had told you to go and slay a Leviathan, if he had done any of these things, would you not have done it? How much more then? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored. It became clean like that of a young boy. Well, we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, now for a while, and we will be here for a while. And in 1 Corinthians, in, in this first letter that Paul has sent to the church in Corinth, we've, we've seen and we've learned that this is a people of God, that Paul loves them dearly, that he is confident that God is going to complete and finish the work that he has began in them. But like any congregation, what we've seen, we've seen that there are problems in the church. We've seen that they've destroyed the unity of the body for the sake of human leaders. They've turned into factions and parties. And unfortunately, in this day and age, in the 21st century, we know what happens when we turn to factions and parties. This church is divided. And Paul has set his mind to helping them regain unity. And so he is 
begun speaking about the power of Christ in the cross. And in 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the message of the cross, I'll remind you in 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, is the way the NIV translates it. Other translations are not with words of wisdom or sound, fine-sounding arguments, but not with those things, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then in 18 he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. So let's back this up and look. He starts out, for the message of the cross. What is the message of the cross? What is he talking about? We have a cross. There's a message in it. What is it? Do we know? Do you know what that really is, that cross? Do you know what that cross really is? Do we understand what this symbol meant? Maybe not, because we don't understand the history. We don't know if the Romans invented it or not. We've, we've got archaeological evidence and historical evidence that people had been staked to poles as a method of execution for thousands and thousands of years. We do know that King Herod the Great, the one who built the temple that the Jews seemed to love so much, took 800 Pharisees and had them crucified in the temple's grounds in front of their families. After having them crucified, he killed all the women and children. Of course, this is the same king who went to Bethlehem and had the children in Bethlehem butchered so that he could just simply get rid of the Christ. The Roman uh, general Titus, during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, took thousands and thousands of Jews who were fleeing the city of Jerusalem and had them crucified around the city. Josephus tells us that there were so many crucifixions that they ran out of space and they ran out of wood. Crucifixion was such a brutal means of execution that the Roman lawyers had actually written into the law that Roman citizens could not be crucified. It was illegal. It was too horrific for them. It was so bad that one of their men said in a speech before the Senate, the word crucifixion should not even be uttered in the hearing of Roman citizens. It is this message that is brought before the Greeks and that Paul will later say is a stumbling block. The message of the cross for the world is insanity. The message of the cross for the world is go and look for your salvation in a nuclear bomb. Go and look for your salvation in an electric chair. But the message of the cross for Christians is different. For Jews, it should be different. Paul says in Galatians that, Christ, that the law was a tutor meant to lead us to Christ. What does that actually mean? What does it mean that this message of the cross, what is this message of the cross for God? It's this, that you're not capable. You see, the law as a tutor was meant to teach us that you're not capable. Think about it. Think of the story of Abraham for a second. Abraham was a great guy, a great success, a friend of God, with no failures, right? He never made any mistakes. And those of you who know Genesis know that's not true. He gave up his wife for a prostitute, did he not? He took another woman to bed on his wife's advice. Not a good idea. Lot, standing in the city of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels come banging on his door. And what happens? Does he say, 
Does he say to those who were coming after him, does he say to them, no, 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 go, don't do this. No, what does he say? Take my daughters instead. Do you remember that? Jacob practiced rampant favoritism in his family. And it had great repercussions. Moses, um, rather, Moses, the great prophet, he, was, he did everything perfectly, didn't he? Oh, that's right. Killed an Egyptian at the age of 40. God told him to go. He rejected God. Then when they're traveling, he strikes the rock, dishonoring God instead of speaking to it. David, a man after God's own heart, surely he succeeded, right? Oh, who can forget Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, one of his mighty men that he betrayed. What about Solomon? Solomon had it down. He had the wisdom of God, did he not? And yet, the story leaves Solomon on his knees before idols. What is it that the law and the prophets are telling us over and over again? That we cannot do this. That even if I am a man after God's own heart, even if I have the wisdom of God himself, we cannot do this. And so the message of the cross is this, God did it. He came in human flesh. He put on humanity. And he went and died for you and me. This is the message of the cross. That he obtained the righteousness that we could not do. Foolishness ridiculousness. Think about it. Think if you were a Greek in the first century. What God out of the Greek or Roman pantheon would submit himself to a disgraceful death on the cross? It's insanity. What God who is so far above us would deign to put on human flesh? It's crazy. That is exactly what our God did. So to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This isn't just the means of a brutal execution. This isn't just the means by which we execute rebels and criminals. But on this thing, I died in Christ. My God, our God, loves us that he would take the most shameful execution possible. The most horrible death imaginable. And he suffers it for you and for me. This is what God means when he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Because nobody could possibly see this. Where is the wise person, he says in verse 20? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So often when we read this, and when we go back and we look at verse 17, that the NIV translates that, you know, I came to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, right? Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. We come here and we say, see, God detests human wisdom. Understand that what this is talking about is not what you and I would consider wisdom. Think, what is wisdom for us, for the Christian, for the redeemed, for the one who has been cleansed by the death of our Savior? What is wisdom? It's not the beginning of wisdom and fear of the Lord. Is that not what we believe? Oftentimes, we'll think of wisdom today from a world, maybe even a worldly perspective, but we'll think of wisdom today as experience. I've been there and done that. I've gained a little bit of wisdom Paul isn't attacking that. I got up here a couple weeks ago and I pointed out that part of the frustrations we have with dealing with one another is that exact thing. You've got a preacher who's been here for four years and brothers and sisters who've been in the church for 30. I'm going to come up with ideas sometimes that don't work. And I need to be told that. That's not what Paul is talking about here. 
When Paul says, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? When he says that, I didn't come to preach with wisdom or eloquence, he's not talking about having logic or good argumentation. That's not what he's talking about. Peter will tell us. He will say, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Always be ready to give an answer to the people that ask you for the reason for the hope that is in you. That always be ready to give an answer. In the Greek, that's the, the idea of giving a defense, an organized defense. Paul himself, before the Areopagus, will go and will lay out a logical argument for the God of this creation. That he is not an idol made of stone or wood, but the living God who is not far from any of us and who has guided the ages. It's one, of, it's, one of the, it's one of the most phenomenal arguments that Paul offers. Remember that in Romans 1, what is, God, what is Paul to remind the church? That we all know that there is a God, that we know because of the creation. Paul was well-versed in rhetoric and logic. Did not he stand before King Agrippa? And doesn't the text tell us that he motioned with his hand? When, those would, when lawyers would get up and present defenses or cases or make logical arguments, they would begin in that day and age. It was a custom. They would begin by raising their hand. What Paul is talking about here is not arguments with logic or arguments that are reasonable. That's not what he's talking about. What he is talking about is the absolute failure of mankind to coherently argue for a system outside of God. What do you mean? In their day and age, they had things like Stoicism, Epicureanism. They had things like Cynicism, the Cynics, which is different from the Cynicism we have today. A comparative example for us today would be things like Humanism. They'd be things like Capitalism or Communism or socialism. Let me ask you, church, does communist, communism lead us to God? Is that what gets us there? No. And if you didn't know this, the, one of the very first tenets of communism is materialism, which is, there is no God. It's the very first thing it teaches. Socialism is the same way. What about capitalism? We're good capitalists in this country, aren't we? We like capitalism, don't we? But is capital, does capitalism in and of itself lead us to God? One of the worst things we could ever have in this world is unrestrained capitalism because it leads to materialism. These worldviews are all deficient. What Paul is saying here is like, is like this. Where is the great democratic orator of our time? Where is the great republican orator of our time that has led us in to great prosperity? Where is he, church? I'll wait, point him out. If you think that republicans have the answer, if you think that democrats have the answer, you are falling into the same trap as the, the Corinthian church did. Because neither of them do. Understand that it is our two-party system that has gotten us to the problems we have today. And if you're looking for salvation in those things, you will be sorely disappointed. That's what Paul is talking about here. When he says, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its systems, through its isms, through its idolatry, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness. Because that's what's up. Think about it. Think, think, re really think about it for a second. And there was a philosopher in China who came along and said during their warring state period, it was brutal. 
The Warring State period, if you're not familiar with it, you can go look this up for yourself, but it was absolutely brutal. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Chinese were being slaughtered in, in mass attacks. It was horrible. Women and ch I mean, it was just brutal. And many, many of their greatest thinkers, uh, this was during the time of Confucius and others, they came up with these systems, these ideas, trying to right this ship, trying to bring the warring factions together. And there was one philosopher, I forget his name, it runs away from me, but there was one philosopher who came and he said this. He said, the way we're going to stop the slaughter, the way we're going to stop the brutal attacks, the way we're going to stop killing each other is this. We need to love each other more than we love our own family. That's what he said. The Chinese laughed at him because in their mind it was ridiculous that you would love a complete stranger more than you love your own father or mother or children. But is that not exactly what Christianity is about? Is that not exactly what our God did when he came and he gave his life up on that cross? Is that not exactly what he commands his followers to do? Think Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He tells them in the upper room, John 13, 34 and 35, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And it's by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When he was asked what the greatest commandment in the law was, he didn't list one of the Ten Commandments. He didn't go to one of the big chapters. He went to obscure places and said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Over and over and over again, what the cross says is this, give yourself up for people that you hate, for people that you despise. Give yourself up, because that's exactly what Christ did. The world calls this foolishness, but God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. This is the truth. Jews demand signs. And we saw this all throughout the gospel. The Pharisees wanted sign and sign and sign and sign. But they really didn't want signs, did they? Because it didn't matter how many Christ gave them exactly what they asked. They refused to believe. It got so bad that at one point the Jews looked at Jesus and they said, even though we know this is the Spirit of God, he's casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the prince of darkness. Jesus looked at that and said, this is an unforgivable sin. What is that? What is this unforgivable sin that everybody stresses about so much? It's quite simple. This is what it is. You have to know that it's the Spirit of God working, and you have to make the decision to attribute that work to the enemy instead. Two things. You have to know it's the Spirit of God working, and you have to attribute it to the power of the enemy. How insane do you have to be to do that? That's not something you stumble into lightly. That's a studied opposition. And the Pharisees in the first century, these Jews in the first century, despite the multiple signs that Jesus gave, continued to oppose him. And of course, Greeks look, look for wisdom. And there no, is no wisdom in self-sacrifice. There is no wisdom. There is no power in that thing. But look at 23, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God for redemption. The wisdom of God. Because those, who, those of us who are saved, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Two facts, that we could not do it, but him having done it for us, now walk and follow and live a loyal life. And even though we do not do this perfectly, we long and look forward to the redemption that he has promised. 
the fulfillment of the salvation, the resurrection of the dead that he has promised. Because he has done it. Look at verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The power and wisdom of God is this. Sacrifice and love. And by these things, he has now reached out. He has called to not only Jews, but to Gentiles. And he has made, through this gospel, through this act of sacrifice that has been confirmed in the resurrection, he has made the two groups one. Isn't it interesting that no matter where, a, a study of human history is essentially a study of division. We are constantly looking for reasons to divide. In our country, we've seen it, Republicans and Democrats. In their time, it was Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, Roman citizens and barbarians. And yet the message of the cross is simple. They are all now one in Christ Jesus. All of these walls have been demolished. And it's not based on what you have done. It's based on what he did. So this morning, if you don't know where you stand with your Creator, if you don't know where you stand with your God, but you'd like to know, and you'd like to learn more about this gospel that He has called us into, or if you're here this morning and you have forgotten the power and wisdom of God, you have forgotten that Christianity is about sacrifice and love one for another, the pursuit of peace, Christianity isn't about you. If you have forgotten these things, I'm going to be back there in the prayer room. We have elders standing up in the back. If you need to come this morning, I ask that you come as we stand.